Hello, and welcome to this episode of Bondcast, the podcast series where we discuss the biggest themes and events shaping rates markets. I'm John Briggs, our regular host, Imogen Bakker, is on holiday, and we'll be back next week. But it's been a very busy week with a lot of central bank action, so let's get right into it. Much of that central bank action was hawk- hawkish, but let's start in the UK as we're recording right after that has been released. And it's in the UK markets we're seeing actually the biggest reaction of the week. Theo, what's the big news here? It's, uh, I would say, just of the week, probably one of the biggest reaction within the last three months. So um, it is really interesting how one specific paragraph of the minutes can totally change the tone of a meeting. That paragraph said that rate hikes can happen even without the QE program having concluded. The market interpreted that clearly hawkish. So it has been a very strong signal for real rate flatteners. Basically, um, we saw different investors selling inflation at the front of the curve, but also selling the specific bonds. At the same time, the meetings, the upcoming meetings become live meetings. For example, I mean, the the November meeting, to be precise, is is, is a live meeting, and um, we cannot exclude the chance of of, of having a rate move. Well, previously, um, that was seen as extremely, extremely unlikely. So... From today, we got a significant setup at the front of the curve. We got a significant flattening move. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's, it's, it's important that it is a matter of timing. It's not a matter of probabilities. It is not that the BOE said that the probability of hikes has increased. Um, it's not that they said that the magnitude of hikes ha- has increased. It's, it's really that... Uh, um, it's, 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 it's a matter of timing, and yet it's, it's quite significant. To me, the other point is that the, there were probably some dovish expectations into the meeting, uh, and, and, and those got disappointed. So uh, did we expect some hawkish tilt? Absolutely. And in terms of views, we had a short five-year, five-year position heading into the meeting. Um, but to be fair, we did not expect a change in timing, and that change in timing even to cause such a significant flattening at the front end of the curve. So it sounds sorry, I was stuck on mute. So it sounds like, um, you know, I don't know, you sound a little skeptical about the moves. I mean, what do you think about the market moves? Do you agree with them? You know, what's your view from here, given given we have had such a big move? Yeah, I guess uh, we were looking for, uh, you know, for an opportunity to uh, to look at fading the move. And, and today we get the opportunity to fade, actually, this repricing at the front of the curve. So one point where uh, my colleague Russ Walker and I, uh, we're different from the market is that, yes, we do think that hikes will take place next year, but we don't think that those hikes will happen that soon. Um, so we we disagree with the, with, the, with the price. Basically, we think that there is too much already. And the price expectations are very high. At the same time, we think that the risk reward profile favors receiving position, received positions at the front end of the Sonia curve. Because when you think about it, the August meeting as of last year told us also that negative rates are a possibility. Now, of course, nobody talks about negative rates now, but things can change. And two years' time is, is actually quite a long uh, time. And, you know, um, if you think about it with, for example, things there's a one year, one year forward at 62 basis points, does this go to 70 something or can it go back to the area of 45, 50? We think that actually, there are chances of those forwards moving lower. The other point is that, you know, um, once we hit the 0.5% in the bank rate, then we'll be talking about quantitative tightening, a potential non-reinvestment of gills. And this is significant. I mean, the Bank of England, they play down and they say that this does not matter. But if market stability has been, um, you know, has been established, has been supported, by those QE flows, then pretty much stopping those flows and stopping reinvestments uh, could potentially give us some more volatility and at the same time could uh, demand some more premium uh, across the curve and, 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 and at the same time make it more difficult for the BOE to tighten. So in our view, even if we were to go to 0.5%, we think that hikes beyond that are um, a little bit more difficult, not impossible, but a little bit more difficult. And also we talk about a terminal rate that will be otherwise lower than uh, what we've seen in earlier years. 
I think that's really interesting because you know, you've tended to be on the bearish side of the UK market for a long time. So, you know, listeners, I think, should take note of the fact that, you know, in the front end, at least, you feel like you're going a little bit the other way. So one more uh, quick question on, on the UK before we shift over to the US. Um, what about on the inflation market side? I mean, you're, you're, you dual had as our UK rate strategist, but also, you know, do run our inflation strategy in the UK and US. So um, what do you think about the market moves there? Do you agree with them or any strong views? I think we think that there's been obviously um, a lot of volatility uh, in the market and all the news flow on gas prices has been reflected, especially when we look at um, next year's pricing. Uh, so uh, when we look at what the market prices in, for example, between March and September 2022, which is the period right after um, the, the, the current uh, energy price cap lapses, that, uh, that is largely fair. What we do think is that, um, well, um, front end inflation expectations in the UK are, are high, are at a high level. Um, if we have to choose between uh, fading them or going with them, we think that probably, you know, th that, that pricing, the current pricing is quite ambitious. So we think that uh, chances are high that this will uh, move lower. Um, but to be fair, uh, we, we find that the UK inflation market, as it is right now, it should be more treated on an RPI print to an RPI print simply because the market volatility that we see during a period is, is particularly high. So even, even if you have the right view and, and it does materialize, for example, um, five years, the volatility that we get from, uh, you know, from one meeting to the other meeting um, make holding such positions very, very difficult. So um, this is why we think that, yes, we, uh, we do have a bearish bias. Um, but it's, 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 it's really uh, a more a meeting by meeting or I would say an RPI print to RPI print story rather than, you know, um, just sit on the position and relax. Gotcha. All right. Thanks, Theo. So, uh, John, I'm going to turn to you. The UK sequencing is quite different from the US and the Fed. But before we get to that, I want to start with the taper conversation. Uh, we know the Fed's watching employment as the marker for, for starting taper. But Powell kind of reset expectations on that, didn't he? Yeah, he really did. And I think uh, I'll read from, from the communications around TAPER were uh, that we did get a lot of clarity. He, at first, he did the statement started sort of vague. You know, he said uh, the statement was changed that if uh, moderation, the pace of asset purchases uh, may soon be warranted. So as soon as the market saw that state, along with the dots that uh, we can discuss after, uh, you know, the market immediately reacted by selling off the belly. It makes sense, but it was sort of vague. However, during the press conference, uh, Powell did clarify that even though soon, that, that whole soon maybe warranted thing actually is looking like it could be November. In fact, what was more striking, the way uh, what you mentioned about jobs is that he wasn't even looking for, a, he, he himself said he's not looking for a knockout jobs number at the, at the October print. He said a decent one would be fine and it would be enough for him to meet this significant, uh, you know, the, the significant criteria that they've been significant progress criteria that they've been talking about. So to me, it sounds like he was ready to announce tapering at this meeting, but uh, they couldn't since they couldn't commit to anything like that since they should give they committed to giving uh, ample notice to the market. And basically, you know, all but for him, substantial criteria, substantial progress is met. He said all but all but met. So uh, we are assuming that November is going to be the, the announcement and November is a go for, for the start of tapering. Second, and I would say perhaps even more importantly, uh, Chairman Powell mentioned during the press conference that they envision winding down the taper process mid-2022. So that's very critical. That kind of tells us, doesn't matter if they you know, announce in November, start in December, or even if they start in announce in December, doesn't matter. They have a concrete plan of finishing mid-2022, uh, so the summer of 2022. Where does that leave us? Uh, well, in August, we did write that our expected path for the, for the Fed's reaction function around tapering would be start in November, sorry, announce in November, but start the actual reductions in December with a 15 billion uh, a month base, uh, which means 10, split 10 billion in treasuries, 5 billion in mortgage MBS securities. So. We, we also assumed that each reduction would come at a subsequent meeting as opposed to on an automated month by month basis, which sort of adds a little bit more lag given that uh, meetings are not necessarily every month. 
So we, we envisioned taper winding down in September 2022. After this week's FOMC, our timeline seems to be even slower compared to what we got from Powell. SEP 2022 isn't quite the middle of next year. Therefore, we consider, I guess, two realistic scenarios that we think could, this can play out. One, Fed could announce taper in November, but also start in reducing in November, announcing each cut uh, on a meeting by meeting basis again. Pace stays at 15 billion a month, uh, 15 billion per announcement. That uh, that shows taper would end in July 2022. Second scenario that we think we could see an announcement in November. The cuts actually do start in December, but this time it's on a pre-announced monthly schedule. They don't wait for each meeting to make an announcement. And this scenario. Yeah, purchases end June 2022, both consistent with the mid-2022 uh, message that we received from Powell. Uh, both seem plausible for us and sort of, uh, you know, adjust the dynamic for rate hikes as well, uh, opens up for end of that year. But as far as the jobs report goes, goes that was really high on our risk dashboard. I think now uh, it, the importance still stands, but it probably is slightly less important for the jobs report to be extraordinary. Like Powell said, it could be a decent one and we're a go. Great. Yeah, agree with all of that for sure. And, you know, I think it is still a very important number, but like you said, it's lower threshold means that, you know, perhaps I think this pricing in of tapering is probably appropriate. So um, that's, that's tapering. What about the dots and rate hikes? As we noted, very different type of sequencing from the UK. Um, what do we learn as far as the Fed's rate hike path? Yeah, go into the meeting, obviously all eyes were on tapering and dots and dots hit the headlines. And as soon as that, the curve kind of bear flattened. And it makes sense because the dots did show uh, more tightening, I think, what compared to what market was expecting. For next year, two more officials increased their median for, uh, uh, sorry, two more officials increased their rate hike forecast, which pushed up the median. Uh, and for 2023, all but one of the FOMC officials compared to five in uh, in June had increased, had tightening in their, uh, in their forecast. So basically the market received a lot more uh, kind of hawkish stance from the Fed as far as their forecasts go. And at first when we got that sort of vague may soon be warranted statement, my initial reaction was to think, okay, well, they're raising their inflation forecast a little slightly higher, not that much. They're increasing their tightening view uh, in line of the increased forecast, uh, but they're not really committing to tapering this year. So it was a little bit of a mixed message, which of course got cleared in the press conference afterwards. But but I would say the dots do show, uh, you know, the Fed's commitment to continuing with the tightening. Of course, after uh, after we finish off with the tapering process next year, and I think as far as rate hikes go, although we should separate tapering from uh, rate hikes as per you know what the Fed wants to you know theoretically suggest, practically hard to achieve. I think December next year looks. Uh, not out of the picture for, for tightening. September perhaps too early, but December certainly looks like it could be in play. All right. So given all of that, how does that impact our core, you know, U.S. flattening, weaker belly views? Yeah. So our views uh, have been concentrated around things like five stance flatteners, uh, two five stands, you know, like with the weakness in belly. The fives have certainly underperformed. I mean, we, we have been receiving the reaction we think along with the, the where we are in the market cycle. We still remain with our five stands flattener views. The the whole fly structure is now reaching our targets at 20 basis points. So uh, we're probably going to wind that off. But uh, we still think there's a little bit more room for flattening. You know, the market's going to, you know, with this, I, I think, hawkishly tilting meeting, the market might still reevaluate that the Fed is you know, committed to going the course and they're not really pulling back. They're not really worried by, uh, you know, the recent risk off, anything like that. The job, the economy seems at a good pace for them. So, uh, so I think we, we still stick with our, you know, core view of weaker belly. All right, great. Well, Giles, not as exciting a week for Europe, though I know bonds are awfully close to your Q3 target of minus 25 basis points, something even by least four or six weeks ago seemed far away. But we only have about two, two and a half basis points to go. Yeah, are they just being dragged there by other markets, or is there some other factor that perhaps is more directly influencing the, the move higher in yields in Europe? I think it's a bit of both. Um, clearly, there's always a sensitivity with other markets, and you know, those have been... No, I, I suppose leading the way to a certain extent. No, I think also just coming off last week, which was awfully inflationary. You know, we all, I know, and we've been saying week in, week out that, you know, I mean, 
the the euro area is is doing well. I mean, we've just had a little you know, bit of slightly weaker survey data today, actually. So, you know, I mean, that is slowing. But nonetheless, I mean, the Euro European economies are doing well. Um, you know, they uh, are well, in, well insulated from you know, kind of COVID tail risks and so on. Um, you know, it, it, it's all consistent, I think, with uh, you know, a more inflationary sort of well, um, well established recovery, to be honest with you. So obviously, I'm not that surprised that uh, I'm pleased to see that it's happening. Uh, I was surprised to the extent that you know, often the best laid plans don't come to pass. But um, you know, it's nice to see uh, the market kind of moving in line with fundamentals a little bit. And I think it's just been eased along the way by a lot of supply um, in the first part of this month. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit concerned, um, I have to say, about, um, about, about the, the momentum uh, with which you know, this, is, this is sustained. And obviously, what Theo, um, in fact, I mean, I suppose, you know, slightly hawkish, uh, or quite hawkish, uh, central banks elsewhere, you know, just you know, tee people up for you know, thinking about um, you know, the, you know, what's possible, I suppose. On, on the downside, but I am a little bit concerned about the way this might follow through. And in, in particular, I'll just say I'm a little bit concerned about um, the possibility that people start thinking that maybe the ECB might kind of do a switch and uh, maybe so take, you know, follow the attitude the Bank of England appears to be taking potentially about um, uh, switching the sequencing of QE, which is something that we've heard again and again and again from, from uh, investors. Uh, and, I, and I've said, you know, I've, I think actually, you know, when it comes to policy making, probably, you, know, you can probably make a fairly decent case that that's a, that's a sensible thing to do, but you know, we still strongly believe that that's not going to happen. We we'll really push back against any effort you know, in the European markets to kind of follow the global move too far, particularly in the sort of two to five year area. Uh, now that's what we saw back in April, March, April last year. Um, you know, big pushback from the ECB. Nobody expects it. So, with that in mind, do you still see zero basis points as a ten-year bond target by the end of the year? I mean, kind of in, inherently a little bit of a steepening feel to that. What your comments there? Yes, I I do think that that is still possible. Um, I, I think the only reason that we would take that off were, would, would be if we saw, um, I guess the the fundament, no, the economic fundamentals not not following the path that we more or less have in mind, and no, that's not the way that we see things at all. At all. Um, you know, we still think, for example, that uh, growth and inflation for, uh, forecasts are going to be revised up over the coming weeks and months and you know, this week one of the more interesting things we haven't talked about is um, the OECD gave its, uh, its, its most recent update and they uh, upgraded their inflation forecast and the growth forecast as well but their inflation forecast in particular uh, quite significantly so they're now looking for 1.9 percent uh, average inflation in the euro area for next year you know I, I think that others will will follow in that direction and, you know, as the consensus can kind of consolidates around a uh, more robust and inflationary recovery, then we naturally move in that direction. You know, the, the other thing that um, you know, didn't really get a lot of commentary because of the combination of central banks and data, um, but you know, which I think is significant this week, is we've got the French um, 2022 draft budget. And you know, they are for, you know, they're penciling in the same amount of issuance this year. Uh, it's considerable consolidation in terms of budget deficit to GDP compared to this year, but it's still uh, you know, a pretty significant deficit. And you know, I think that just sets a tone for, uh, you know, I guess, more expansionary fiscal policy across the euro area, you know, extending into to next year and potentially beyond. I mean, let's see what happens with the. German elections at the weekend, but you know, that seems to be to us uh, the direction of travel um, supports the overall view. And I think there's an adjustment there in the markets to accommodate that. Great. Thanks, Charles.
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bondcast. As always, please remember to hit subscribe so you can watch our latest episodes as soon as they're available and hit the like button so it's easier for others to find it. Thank you very much and have a good week.